Amen. Uh, so we are in James chapter 3, or James chapter 2, actually. This is the third week in James, so pull out your Bibles if you would. We are jumping right into it. It's also going to be on your screens, and if you're a smartphone person, uh, pull out the Bible app, and you can go along with us on your smartphone. But uh, this has been a super fun series uh, to be doing. Um, we are going chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the book of James. It's a small letter written by Jesus' half-brother, James. So they had the same mother, Mary, but um, not the same father. Amen? Virgin birth, right? You know all that good theology, right, at Christmas time? Um, So James wrote this, and it's an amazing book. So chapter 2, verse 1, my dear brothers and sisters. So he's talking to Christians here. He says, how can you claim to have faith In our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, if you favor some people over others, some of your uh, translations say, if you walk in favoritism, if you show favoritism, what James says here is God does not have favorites. God does not have favorites. Amen? Like, we think about the love of God. You know, like, people come and they say, God loves you. But what does that mean? This is one of the things it means. God doesn't have favorites. I love that about God. Um, I love, too, in this first verse, he says, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? This is important. As scholars tell us, James is one of the earliest letters written in the New Testament. And, And by earliest, I mean closest to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They estimate it was written maybe 50 or, or 55 A.D., um, so, so maybe 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, James was written. This is important because James is talking to the church here super early after Jesus' resurrection, and James is referring to him as God, the glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see that title there and that word glorious there? What he's referring to, if you're an Old Testament scholar this morning, is he's referring to, referring to the Old Testament Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of God. Uh, this, this was huge, the very presence of God, that whenever people were worshiping God, talking to God, uh, uh, learning about God in his word, that was one thing. But the Israelites had the tabernacle and it followed them. Do you remember the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud? It was the Shekinah. It was was evidence to the presence of God, that God was amongst them. And James is sitting here saying that when Jesus Christ came, he was amongst us. He is the Shekinah. He's calling him God there. And James, do not forget, grew up in the same household as Jesus, knew every single annoying habit he had. And James is so convinced in the divinity of Jesus that he calls him this. Verse 2, for, for example, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. So James is about to give us an illustration here. He says, Jesus has no favorites. God has no favorites, so you in the church cannot have favorites. And I'm going to give you an example. Sometimes people make favorites of rich versus poor, and you can't do that. He says, so imagine you're in a, a church meeting, just like this one, and, and, and people are sat around. And it could be a modern church. It could be an ancient church, but still have to have seats. Amen? You still got to put people in seats. And sometimes there's seating problems, and that's what he imagines here is there's, there's a limitation on seats, and there's kind of too many people. But there's one special seat left, and it's a good seat. Have you ever gone to a life group before in somebody's living room, and they're out of seats, and they say, well, you're going to have to sit on the floor? I mean, you can do it, but that's not comfy, right? So what he's saying here is you've got a comfy seat, and you've got a not-so-comfy seat, and you're going to give the comfy seat to who? The rich person. The rich person. He says they're they're in expensive jewelry, fancy clothes, stylish clothes. They look right. They look modern, right? You're drawn to them visually. And some of your translations say instead of jewelry, it says gold rings. And gold rings is the literal there. Gold rings is important because in Roman culture, if you wore a gold ring, and the bigger the better, by the way, that was a statement about your wealth and your position in society. They actually, uh, scholars have gone back or or, or archaeologists have gone back, and they have found evidence that there used to be rental shops in ancient Rome, where you could rent a gold ring. 
because it was a special occasion and you wanted to show somebody that you were more wealthy than maybe what you were. Verse 3, if you give special attention in a good seat to that rich person, but you say to the poor one, you stand over here, over there, or else sit on the floor, not the not-so-comfy seat, well, doesn't this discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? So, so James comes right in. I, I told you last week, he's like the Gordon Ramsay of New Testament writers, right? He's in your face, and James is going to tell it to you straight. And he says, if you're doing this, it's evil. Ooh, you got to use that word, James. How about maybe I just need to work on that a little bit? You know? No, he's, he's going to call that evil. Verse 5, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? So not only does he say God doesn't favor the rich, he says, instead, God favors the poor. Okay, now I'm not trying to elevate the poor, say the poor are perfect or anything like that today. But what he's saying is there's something about the nature of poor people that more often choose God, more often choose faith. So here, here's a companion uh, passage for you. It's not on your screens. But if you're taking notes, it's 1 Corinthians 1.26. He says, remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful, or wealthy when God called you. It's a moment where Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he's like, when I look out statistically across Christians, most of you weren't too smart. Most of you weren't too educated. Most of you weren't too powerful. Most of you weren't too pretty. Like, he didn't say pretty there, but he meant it. <laughs> he meant all of it. He meant all the ways that we humans like to have power and like to be strong. It's like, generally speaking, it's not the strong people who end up in church. Statistically, there's plenty of wealthy people that have very strong faith in Christ. A lot of pretty people have really strong faith in Christ, right? But statistically speaking, what, what, what is it about the poor? It's not that, not that God just likes poor people. It's that there is something within the poor that realize their need for God more readily and those of us that are wealthy, we a lot of times like to depend on our wealth, and we want our wealth to save us. And we're okay. We could take a little bit of Jesus. Like, let's, let's mix in a little bit of Jesus with my life, because most of my life is taken care of, because I've got 401ks, and I've got accounts, and I've got insurance, and I've got all the things that I need. And so I just need a little bit of Jesus. And that's the way wealthier people tend to talk in the midst of their strength. And Jesus said to people, he's like, it's not, the, it's not the, the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick that need the doctor. And so Jesus came for the sick. And who are the sick? Well, we're all sick, but, but those of us that understand that we're sick, those of us that wake up understanding how desperately we need God, and if we don't have Jesus today, if I don't have Jesus today, I won't make it. If I don't have Jesus today, my, my, my marriage won't make it. My family won't make it. My job won't make it. I won't make it. And when you're in that kind of spot, you are poor in spirit. And that kind of poverty is what he's talking about here. So he, he, James is saying, like, why in the world, if that's the case, why in the world would you favor rich people and give them the best seats? Don't you realize God is working in the poor? Verse 8, yes, indeed, it is good when you obey the royal laws found in scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin and you are guilty of breaking the law. And this is just, this is just James in his flow of thought here. He's, he's answering a quick objection that some people might have. So he's saying, listen, you can't favor rich over poor when you set up seating, right? And you could, you could hear somebody hearing the letter of James and saying, but hey, hold on a second, James. Isn't it okay for me to offer seats to rich people? Well, of course it is. Isn't it okay for me to love rich people and love my rich neighbors like I love myself? Of course that's, that's okay. And he's answering that objection. He's like, of course that's okay. But it's not about the fact that you're loving them. It's about the fact that you're favoring them over somebody else. 
And it's the favoritism that is the sin. Now, I've got two um, volunteers here. We've got Matt and Hannah. If you guys would run right on up here. This is The Price is Right. Let's go. Give them a hand as they, as they come on up. All right, now, they're dressed differently. I don't know if you noticed. They're dressed differently on purpose. We are in the middle of Oklahoma here, amen? Do any of you have feelings about sports teams? Come on. Okay, do any of you have feelings about this sports team? Oh, my. Do any of you have feelings about this sports team? <laughs> this, this service, I, I'm going to give you a do-over. That was a mulligan. That was really, really terrible. You're almost like sinking my illustration right now. <sighs> sports people told me this would work, okay? So the idea is this is meant to elicit feelings deep inside your sports souls. And I need you to express such sports feelings from deep inside your souls. So do you have feelings today? Do you have feelings? Okay, all right. Give them a hand as they have a seat. My goodness. (laughs) Thank you for the help. Yep. Uh, okay. So here's the thing. Uh, sports. Uh, we, we have feelings about colors and logos and teams, and we see people on the street, don't we? Like, let's get real. We see people on the street, and they dress like we dress, or they act like we act, and we see visual cues on them. And those, based on those visual cues, we draw really quick conclusions without even thinking about it. You're safe. You're somebody I can talk to. Like this bus ride, this train ride, this, 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 this flight, it's going to be a fun one because we've got some things in common. I bet I can trust you. I bet you talk like me. I bet you think like me. All of those things, just they, they roll right through our brains. And all of a sudden, there's a closeness there because the external, we match. And some of it, it, it goes deeper with us, those other externals, right? There's lots of externals I could be talking about right now, right? Some of the externals that we have feelings about that are deep in our souls, some of those feelings, they're attached to not not, not just teams, they're attached to race, they're attached to nationality, they're attached to gender, they're attached to age, they're attached to all kinds of things. And some of the reasons that we got big feelings attached to those things is because we got pain in our past. Or some some of the reason that, that we got feelings, deep feelings that are attached to those things is because there are, are people that, that brought us up, like grandma and grandpa and mom and dad, and they had those feelings, and they taught us to have those feelings. And it's handed down. And to, to, to decide one day to suddenly stop having feelings about that particular team color feels like a betrayal of this person that we love and trust and feel loyal toward. And it all gets really complicated, isn't it? The amazing thing about this is that when I look inside this shirt and I look at its manufacturer, it says Coliseum. And I look at this shirt and I look at its manufacturer and it says, guess what, Coliseum. Same manufacturer. Two different colors, same manufacturer. I look at all of humanity and all are made in the image of God according to Genesis chapter 1. All are made in the image of God. Every one of you regardless of your color, nationality, education, age, gender, background, all of you are all made by the same manufacturer, and that makes us one. It makes us family. And James is saying, listen, this is how God sees the world. And if God sees the world like this, we got to see the world like this. Whoo. So what's favoritism? It, there's a story in the Old Testament, it's Jacob and his wives. Do you guys remember Jacob, one of the patriarchs? And he marries two women. He marries Leah and he marries Rachel. He's got two wives. And I don't recommend that, by the way. That's a bad, bad idea. But even worse, he adds insult to injury. He, he chooses one that he likes better. Leah, the, the Bible says that Leah 
um, who he marries first, Leah had weak eyes, which is Bible speak for she had a really nice personality, if you know what I mean. So that's Leah. And then Rachel is described by the Bible as she's very, very pretty. And she it becomes Jacob's favorite. And so this, this having a favorite brings all kinds of destruction into Jacob's family. And you can read about that in the Old Testament. Absolutely will blow your mind. Just that one little sin of favoritism and what it can do to a family. And then Jacob has 12 boys, 12 sons. And one of them is Joseph. And Joseph becomes his favorite because he's born to Rachel, who was his favorite wife. And he gets the amazing Technicolor dream coat, if you know that story. Right? That's Joseph. And so you've got Joseph, and you've got 11 brothers who hate Joseph. And that's the way the story goes. Why? Because of the sin of favoritism that comes into a family. And some of you are here today, and, and, and when, I, when I talk about that kind of family favoritism, that, that pain comes right to the surface for you because you know exactly what that's like. And you weren't the favorite child. You weren't the favorite grandchild. You weren't the... I'm not going to say spouse because we're not doing polygamy here in Oklahoma, hopefully. <laughs> but it's pain. And, and some of you guys have told me in the past, you say, you know, you say that God's a loving father, and I had a father. And when you tell me that, that's a struggle for me because the father that I had, I, I would not call loving. Or the family that I came from was a broken family. So when we talk about the family of God, it, it, it's, it's a struggle for me. It brings up more pain. And, and these are the moments for you. Moments like this where, where, where we say unequivocally that if in your family there was favoritism, that was wrong and it was against God. It is not reflective of the heart of God at all. So if you're going you're, you're to come from your earthly family into a heavenly family, into a Christian family, you need to realize that, 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 that God, the big papa, right? He's got no favorites. None. So now think a court of law. Think two people walk into a court of law. And both are accused of a crime. One's rich, one's poor. The judge looks at them. What's favoritism? Favoritism is when the, the judge looks at them and listens to the way that they talk. Did they sound articulate? Did they sound educated? Did they sound like they came from the right side of the tracks? Based on how they dress, does this, does this seem like a person that, that I would like, a person that I think is probably making good moral decisions because I can tell that by the way the, that, that they dress? That sounds silly, but we do it all the time, don't we? And they make judgments about the guilt or innocence based on those externals. Now, when, when a judge does that, you know it's wrong. What should a judge do? If they're not showing favoritism, a judge should look at both of those people and judge them based on the evidence, the facts. And good justice will be based on the evidence and the facts. And that's what you see with God. And I'm going to show you that in the Old Testament. God it's not that God doesn't judge. Some of us would like to come to church and we would like to hear that God will never, ever judge. And, and, and that would feel great, right? <laughs> it's just not true. It's just not what the Bible tells us about him. What God is, is God judges right. And he does not judge based on externals. So we're going to look at that. Um, kinds of favoritism, just, just quickly. Um, and I've already mentioned most of these class, rich versus poor. Um, so many ways, so many ways that you've got to admit to yourself that you're changing your outlook on people based on rich versus poor. Race is such a big question right now in our culture. It's such a hot button issue in our culture. And I really don't care where you're at necessarily politically or who you're listening to politically. Let me just say this as far as race. The Bible cares about this. The Bible cares about race. It cares about whether or not the people of God respond appropriately to race. You're going to see that in the Bible today. So this is an issue. God does not look the other way in our racial behavior toward other people. Do we love people regardless of color? That, that's going to matter. Nationality. Where are you at on nationality? Are there certain people that you've allowed yourself to dislike? Well, I hate, I hate French people. I hate Latinos. I hate Arabs. I hate, you know, is there a group? 
Is there a group that you've, you've told yourself it's okay? And the reason I dislike them or the reason I distrust them right away, as soon as I hear their, their, um, uh, their speak, you know, as soon as I hear their, their accent, the reason I can distrust them is because I am for my people. I'm so for my people that I'm a little bit against other people. You're going to see that in the scripture today, nationality, gender, um, and age. If they're wearing a nose ring, is that going to bother you? Are you going to treat them different? Those darn millennials, amen, somebody, those darn millennials. And, and, and a phrase like that, those darn millennials, you know, what that, you know what that brings with it? That brings with it judgments about trust, Judgment is about character before that person even opened their mouth. Or, or somebody who's, who's past a certain age, they will be old and crotchety and stubborn, amen? We got to not do that. So let's get a theology of biblical favoritism for just a moment. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with a series of verses. This is a, a bit of a Bible-heavy morning this morning. And the reason it is, and I'm going to jump to some different spots, and then we're going to finish up James. The reason is, is because something like favoritism, I need you to know, especially those, who, those of you who've been hurt by a parent, I need you to know deeply that this is not the heart of God. And people have missed the heart of God. And, and God loves people equally. And i got to prove it to you. So let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. And this is where you're going to see that God never judges anybody by externals. So this is a moment where God is speaking to the prophet Samuel about the selection of one of the kings of Israel. And he said, the Lord does not see things the way that you see them or the way that men see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks right to the heart. So that just, you, you could, you could, you could spread that over this whole discussion. That's who God is, and that's how God does it. And we got to do it the same way. Next one. God does not receive faces. Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. He is the great God, the mighty and awesome God who shows no partiality and cannot be bribed. He ensures that orf orphans and widows receive justice. He shows love to the foreigners living among you and gives them food and clothing. So before this was even culturally popular, this is 1400 B.C., these words are written about God the Father, that this is the way that he operates. Even in a Jewish culture, even in the Old Testament law, he, he's not saying just be about the Jewish people. He's saying you take care of everybody. You take care of rich and poor you, you, you take care of the widows and the orphans, anybody that's in need, and the foreigner. And that's big, the foreigner. Because by the time you get to the Gospels and you see the way that they're treating the foreigners, you're like, did they even read this verse? They were supposed to take care of the foreigner, and so are we. And it says that God shows no partiality there in verse 17, and he cannot be bribed. It, it, it's really weird. That, that word partiality is not actually a word in Hebrews. It is a, it, it's a combination of some other words that means he cannot receive faces. It means if, if, if a bunch of faces come walking into his courtroom or sitting down to his family table, he doesn't see the faces. He does not, he does not accept their countenance. He doesn't see the externals. He chooses not to. He chooses to see right through to the heart. And so every time you see this word partiality, even in, even in the New Testament, it means cannot receive the faces of those people. Next one, Mark 12, 14, this is Jesus. It says Jesus didn't have favorites. And they came to him and they said to him, and this, is the, this is Pharisees coming to Jesus here. It says they came to him and they said to him, teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. What he's saying is, what they're saying here, is that they had noticed the reputation of Jesus. And if you were wealthy, or even if you were powerful, and you walked up to Jesus Christ when he was walking the earth, going from town to town, doing his ministry, you were not going to get special treatment by Jesus. That was his reputation. And it was seen as odd in those days. So even Jesus' enemies, the Pharisees, come to him, and they say, we've heard this about you. And they glorify God, even as enemies do. 
Next, God will judge all equally by their actions. This is Romans 2, 9. It says, there will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil, for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. If we can hold right there for a quick second. Notice what it says. It's talking about final judgment here. The the final judgment. It's saying when, when, when everybody has died and everybody comes before God's throne and all the souls for all time are gathered together and we're brought up individually to be judged. He says, regardless of who you are, Jew or Gentile, if you're a person who has done evil, you will be judged as evil. You'll be judged according to your actions. And then the next verse, but there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good for the Jew first and also for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. He does not receive faces. But I got a Jewish face, God. But what did you do? Why? Because our actions show what was going on in our hearts. When I showed kindness... It meant that Jesus Christ had come into my soul and created kindness in me. The character of Jesus had come alive in me because I had given my life to Jesus and therefore actions poured out of me. Patience came into my life. I, I can see the works of patience in my life because and, and generosity and, and loyalty to God is my one king. All those things flow out of a life that have given themselves to Jesus Christ. So we'll be judged based on our actions regardless. Now, why does it say Jew or Gentile there? Another little theological point. The reason is because the Jews had a ton of teaching about God, the one true God, and Gentiles did not. It's like they didn't have the Bible. And what he's doing here is, is Paul's coming and he's saying, listen, even if Gentiles did not have the Bible, there's a, there's, there's a spot in there in, in Romans 2 where it says they still had the word of God written on their heart. They still had enough of the moral code that was written there. Like lies are better than, or I'm sorry, truth is better than lies, amen? Like we know that. You don't have to go to church to know that. We know that loyalty to a spouse is right. We know that courage is better than fear. We know all of these things. Just, we, we just know it, whether we've gone to Sunday school or not. And that's what he's saying is, is people will, will go before the judgment of God and, and they will be judged according to the law that's written in their hearts. Whatever they had, they'll be judged according to their actions. And then God will see their hearts. Now, if you're anything like me, if you say, okay, none of the judgment that's going to happen is based on the externals. It won't be based on my race. won't be based on my education. won't be based on how pretty I am. won't be based on any of those things. That makes me feel good. Amen. Thank God, because I'm not sure how my resume matches up and all that kind of stuff. But if you say, but the second part of the message is that you will be judged based on all of your actions, then my knees start to shake. Then I start to get terrified. Because great news here, but not so great news here. But Jesus. But Jesus. And we're going to get to the Jesus part in a minute. So give me a second on that one. <sighs> Next point is after the judgment, there will be a group of people who pass the judgment because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And there'll be a group of saved people. There's this moment, and they surround God's throne, and they start having a worship service around him. And it's a pretty beautiful sight, and I want you to see it because this is part of his favoritism again, or lack of favoritism again. Revelation 7, verse 9 says, After this I saw a crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language, and they were standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb, and they were clothed in what? White robes. you got to remember that, white robes. And they held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God. So heaven will be a Skittles church. It will be a mega church. It will be a multiracial church. He goes out of his way to name all the different types of people groups that will be there. Why? Because it is proof that God will ultimately not be partial. He will not have favorites, even at the judgment. It will come down to the heart. And so the, the final group of people that makes it through the judgment, they get saved, it's a Skittles church. It's so awesome. And they're worshiping there. 
and they got white robes on, but I'll tell you about the white robes later. Let's finish up James first. Go to verse 10. So I'm still in chapter 2, verse 10. So I gave you that theology of God's lack of favoritism. Now let's finish up. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but do, commit, do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. Now, let's just say there's a thousand laws that you could break. James is saying, if you've passed the test on 999 of them, but you only broke one, you're still a lawbreaker, and you're still guilty. You're like, well, that's not very nice, right? I feel it. But he's saying you're still, you're still someone who's rebelled against God, and you have to know it. And sometimes we, sometimes we like to bargain with God, don't we? Sometimes we like to bring that bargaining to him. And say, I know, that, I know that I screw up here right now, God. I know that I'm not so good at this right now. But in all these other areas, I'm pretty good. Doesn't it like somehow outweigh the other side? And, and, and James is saying that never works with God. You just, you need to know it. I need to tell you the truth. That doesn't work with God. And so if you've got everything else down in the Christian life, but you've got this favoritism issue, you've got to listen this morning. You have to. This is such a huge deal. For all of us. Verse 12, so whatever you say and whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others, but if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. And the ESV there says mercy triumphs over judgment, which is one of my favorites, favorite uh, verses in all of scripture. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's like this picture of, of mercy goes into a ring with judgment, and they fight it out, and mercy wins, right? And that's that's the words he uses there. It triumphs over judgment, the mercy of Jesus Christ. So here's a picture of the final judgment. So imagine that, that judgment, and imagine they they call up my name, right? Like Josh Trueblood, like it's it's Josh Trueblood's turn. Bring him up. Some angel, get the Ten Commandments, bring it up here. And let's just go down the list. How did he do? He lived this many years in the world. Like, how did he do? Do not lie. Roll tape. (laughs) Uh. Next, do not steal. Roll tape. Right, and they just go down the list. Do not covet. Don't, Don't ever long for what other people have to the point that it drives you and drives your decisions, drives your thoughts. Roll tape. Do we have time for all that tape? I don't know. And it just goes on and on. And, and, and my sins aren't in the hundreds or the thousands. My sins are in the millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions, right? Like, my sin. And it's all there. And, and God's like, but it's cool. I'm not, I'm not partial. I'm not going to judge you by externals, Josh. I'm going to judge you by what you've done. And that's a really bad day for me anyway. And it's a really bad day for you anyway. Right? And James has that in mind here in the in this second portion of Scripture. And he's like, you've got to act to other people like people who will be judged by this law that gives freedom and mercy. Because when you get there that day, Your only shot is that you would walk up and say, I know this looks really bad, God. But when I was walking the earth, I reached out to Jesus, and I just begged him to save me. Just like that thief on the cross, I was like, would you remember me today? Would you forgive my sins? Would you forgive my shame in my past? Would you you make it about your resume instead of my resume? Because my resume looks really, really bad. And so, Jesus, you're 100% pure, and Jesus, you never sinned, and and Jesus, you did everything right. And so, God, instead of judging me according to my works, would you judge me according to the works of Jesus Christ? That's what happens. So I pray that prayer, and I pray that sincere prayer, and heaven sees me pray that prayer, and it writes my name in the book of life. That's what happens on this earth. Has that moment happened for you? Have you had your moment? Because if you haven't had your moment, you're not going to make it through that judgment. 
You're like, well, I haven't done all the sins yet. James says it doesn't matter. You follow just one. You follow just this one. And you won't make it through that judgment. The only way you make it through that judgment is if you desperately throw yourself on the mercy of Jesus Christ. And your choice is now, not then. It's now. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And if I am judged by my own works, I am dead meat. My only hope is Jesus. Amen? That is the gospel. So why are we not supposed to walk with favorites in favoritism? I've got a little list for you here. The number one reason we should not walk in favoritism as Christians is because God is not shallow. He just isn't that way. We've been shallow in our lives before. We've done church shallow. Can we face that? God is not shallow. And if we're his people, we should not be shallow people. Go deeper with each other. God is not selfish is, is the second one. God is not selfish. There, there can be a way, and even in the church, and I'm going to be really, really specific here, where a wealthy person comes in and maybe they can do something for me. Maybe they can give me something. Or maybe I'm even a pastor of a church, and maybe they can give some money to the building fund, amen? And maybe I'm driven by that. But that's not God. First Corinthians says that agape love does not seek its own. And if God does not seek his own, we should not seek our own. Instead, we walk in trust of our great God and say, this is the church of Jesus Christ, and you will build it, Jesus. Rich or poor does not matter. I can't think like that. You can't think like that. Our leaders can't think like that. Whoever God brings in the door, amen, you are in the family. Regardless, God is not selfish. Next is that God values the poor. We already talked about this. They need him in a way that the rich often don't realize that they do. Jesus said the sick are the ones that need the doctor. And God values the poor. And if God values the poor, then in our actions and in our life, in our Christian ministry, we should, you should see us valuing the poor. Next, God sees worth in every single person, including you. That's why people can't be shut out because of the color of their skin or their age or their gender or anything else. You can't shut them out because you are devaluing the image of God inside of them. Let me give you an illustration. I used to be a pastor. I still am a pastor, but I used to be a pastor in Illinois. And when I was a pastor in Illinois, I'd been a pastor, I think, maybe five years or so, right? And, and one of the things uh, about the gig of being a pastor is that you're on the stage and you're preaching to people. And without even meaning to, you can start getting this idea in your head that the Holy Spirit works in people's lives in a church service because he does. Like, he convicts people of sin. Lives are changed. It's an amazing thing. It's like, it's, it's really fun to be in here. But you can also go just a baby step further and say, but this is where he is. And by the way, the people in the kids program, they babysit our kids while we're in here with the Holy Spirit. And I didn't even realize that I had drawn that conclusion. It was this tiny little subtle thing that had come into my heart, but it had. And then God in his great love for me, right? Like he's always trying to teach me things. God in his great love for me, he like, he caused our uh, kids pastor to leave. And we went through a nine month time frame where I had to become the interim kids pastor. God help everybody. <laughs> and I did. And I ran in there and tried to project manage that whole thing, you know, and, and uh, you know, increase the quality and, and improve things and all this kind of stuff. But I did not know the deeper message that God was trying to teach me. And I went in and I remember I was in our, our, our uh, uh, elementary kids program this one Sunday. And I'd only been doing this for about a month at that point. And I remember walking in, back of the room, and they're playing the kids' songs. You know, the song and dance and do the motions and all that kind of stuff. They're doing that kind of, of, of kids' worship in there. And the kids are having a great time. And there's this little boy up near the front. And the little boy up near the front, suddenly in the middle of the song, he drifts toward the back and just kind of subtly walks toward the back. He's not distracting anybody, but he just walks toward the back, and I watch him do that. And then I see another little boy that was up near where he was, and he notices that his friend has moved. 
And he gets up, and he walks toward the back. And he comes, and he finds his friend. And the two of them are sitting there whispering to each other while the song's going on. And of course, you know, Sheriff Trueblood, I'm going to deal with that. You know, so I walk up and bend down like, what are you guys talking about? Thinking it's going to be like video games or something like that. And, and, and the second boy, he says, well, there's marriage problems going on with his mom and dad. And there's anger. And it's been really rough for him. And he and I have been talking about it at school, and I knew it's been a really, really rough week, and he's just kind of destroyed over this. And I saw him walk back during the worship, and I figured, and these, these, these boys are like seven, eight years old. <laughs> and the boy looks up at me, and he's like, you know, do you think we could pray for him? <laughs> yeah, we can pray for him. And I step back from that whole situation, and I walk back, and, and the Lord's sitting there like, you didn't think the Holy Spirit was here because of their age. You didn't think the Holy Spirit was here. And the Holy Spirit's here every single Sunday. And it's not just in the adult room. The Holy Spirit's in every room of this church. And, 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 and those of you that are, are serving in our kids' ministry, this was not meant to be a plug, but it's a plug. Those of you that are serving in our kids' ministry, don't go serve there to babysit kids. Go into every room where you serve and search for the Holy Spirit. Because if you search for the activity of the Holy Spirit amongst those kids, you will find him. And you'll learn something much deeper than you ever bargained for. And we need to see that. We need to see that our Father in heaven is a God who's so big and he's so loving that he cares about every single human soul. This is what it's the core of what James is talking about. This is what we miss when we show favoritism. Last thing is that God's mercy erases our categories. Mercy wins. Mercy, the mercy of Jesus Christ and his gospel, it levels the playing field, puts every single human being on the same exact plane. Wealth is only skin deep. Gender is only skin deep. Race is only skin deep. Amen. You should be amen in every single one of these. Amen. It's only skin deep. We are 99.5% genetically the same. The manufacturer is the same. And we forget, and it changes the way we show love to each other in all the tiny little subtle ways that we don't think anybody else sees because we think it, but we don't think they can see it. And they can see it. They can all see it. And James says, you serve a different kind of God from this world, so be a different kind of people. And that matters. We have to be a different kind of people. And you saw that Skittles church in Revelation, and you remember they had the white robes on? Do you know why? Do you know why? Because they've been purified by the blood of the Lamb. They stand under the umbrella of God's mercy. That's why. Because every single tribe, nation, and tongue is still intact in heaven. It is not washed away. John still, in the vision, still sees them. But they're all clothed in white. And it's the mercy of Jesus that has washed them that makes them a family and makes them one church. And it's the kind of unity that God makes, and we could never dream that up without him. Last thing. I think I've said that twice now, last thing. Here you are in church, and let's say next Sunday you walk into church and Oprah walks in and she sits next to you in church. Oh my goodness, can I have a selfie, please? And let's say a minute later, Dwayne The Rock Johnson also walks in and sits in the seat, the other seat next to you, and you're surrounded by fame and fortune and star power. You're sitting there in church. Can I have an autograph? Can I have a selfie? Can I have some money? Can I have something? Did you see who I'm sitting next to? Us, all caught up in what this world does. 
And now let's say worship starts and Jesus Christ himself walks up. Glory. You can't even look at the stage. His love. Blown away. Are you thinking about Oprah and Dwayne the Rock Johnson? No. Because the glory of God, if you actually see it, it levels us all out. And we aren't different anymore. We're all in the same group. It's what he does. It's what he's supposed to do. Amen? Would you guys stand? Let's pray. What we're going to pray right now is a prayer of repentance. So if this is you, join with me right now. Lord, thank you for your truth. Lord, thank you that James comes in and is just just so blunt with us. Lord, sometimes we just need that. And Lord, I pray against (laughs) that kind of whiny little part of us, Lord, that's, that's running for the hills right now and that part of us, Lord, that is trying to hit you with all the things that we've done that's been good. But Lord, I've done all these other things good. God, I've got all these other things. Where, right where Jesus wants them to be, it's, I've just got this one problem. And God, I pray that we'd stop bargaining with you today. And even in that list of, of, of favor, favorites and favoritism, we may have most of that list good, but there's just one just got that one blind spot. Lord, would you come right now, do surgery on our souls and deal with our blind spot. Just deal with the one. And God, I pray that we would let you. God, we got this way, Lord. You get us on the surgery table. We want to wiggle wiggle right off that surgery table. I pray that we'd stay there. We'd let you do the work that you want to do. Come in and expose us, Lord. Help us to see the reality of what needs to change in our lives, God, because it desperately needs to change. And then through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, would you come in and make us a more loving people? Lord, I pray for more loving families all across this room and online. I pray for a more loving city, Lord, that walks in the actual love of God, the quality that our Father in heaven has. Jesus, change us. In Christ's name, amen.